we are building a machine learning model. And in the last video, we didn't do any machine learning. What we did was we filtered our data using something called the XOR strategy. And uh, it's it, it basically was our way of taking this initial table and picking only one topic. <clears throat> we picked one topic. And then we had any number of 1,000 um, 1,000 asteroids to look at. We didn't know which ones. And it got even worse when we had to one-hot encode these, that is, make them into ones or zeros for machine learning. And this 1,100 became 12,000 columns, 12,000 potential columns. Because our data over here is so sparse, that, look at this, so many missings. Just, just from experience, I can tell you that your machine learning models on astro data, especially data like this, has a has an extremely high chance of failure. Uh, they're just not failure as in they're just not going to find anything. What they'll do is they'll say, I'm 95% accurate. And they become 95% accurate by assigning everybody to none. Uh, and then it, it's just too bad if he's known as well. So even in this recording, as we build the machine learning model, we're, we're likely to get a model that doesn't find anything. That's just kind of the nature of, of the beast. But at least... Uh, from what we're about to talk about, you'll learn how to set up a machine learning model uh, for nine. Now, the XOR strategy that we did in the last the last recording, we basically took all these, we turned them into ones and zeros uh, on separate branches. Like the, there's the the feature we're trying to find, which we chose large family, right? And then there's Sorry, the, there's the label we're trying to find, large family, and then there are all the features, okay? But these features get processed, and we did a whole bunch of stuff in order to narrow down which of those features we should even look at. And we went from a possible 12,000, that's 1,100 times 12 signs, and whittled it down to 100. Okay, so here we are. This, this is in the format that we're going to want for an ML model. Before I set up the ML model, um, let me uh, explain a couple of things. If, if you want to be able to do machine learning in NIME, you're going to need to first download NIME and install it. Second, download Anaconda. It, no matter how you feel about Anaconda, or maybe you have no opinion, NIME, it, it's easier to, to get the machine learning nodes to work if you have Anaconda. So with NIME and Anaconda on your machine, you go into preferences and you have to tell NIME where Python is. Anaconda is like a package manager for Python. And so you have to come in, come down here in NIME, Python. And okay, so you can see I have Python 3.76. It found Python on my machine. It probably looked in the path variable. So it, it knows, it's like, okay, cool, you've got Python. And uh, this is just for the regular environment. But for the deep learning nodes, you've got other stuff. Python deep learning. This, this can be a huge pain if you don't have Anaconda and you're fighting versions. What I recommend is that you install Anaconda, you let it find Anaconda, you tell it where it is, and then click on new environment and let Nine make the, the sub environment for you. Um, I chose Keras. I've got Conda. This is actually an old environment under an older version of Python. I had to fight this a couple of days ago. It's, it sucks uh, when you when you have to. And yet it found it. It's got it's got stuff going. And right now it's really using Keras. It's not using this. It doesn't really understand. Look at it. it's giving me yellow messages. You don't want yellow messages. But luckily, when it set up new environment under my old Python, it I named it this, and it's legit. It works. Once that works, then you have the ability to do uh, machine learning and make all the layers and everything in here. You need the nodes that we're going to use. And let's go to install NIME extensions. Let's look at what I already have installed. You'll have to find them before you, obviously, they, they come up on this list. But if you see NIME deep learning Keras integration. I, I downloaded both Keras and TensorFlow, but download these. And when you download these, 
you will find the Keras nodes in all their glory down here. Lots of really fancy stuff. Now let's get started and we're going to use an input layer and a dense layer to do our stuff. In fact, let me tell you everybody you're going to need, at least for this basic setup for machine learning. You're going to need a Keras input layer and a dense layer. It's just a basic, all that is, is basically saying we've got nodes here or neurons, right? They're going to take in a table of a certain size and they're going to do their multiplication and then they're going to feed it into another list of neurons that are mixing and matching things and looking for patterns. Basically, it's trying to optimize values. Um, that, that next layer is, is indicated like here, right? It's, it's, it's layer down and then you could just do it. You could just stack as many layers as you want. But for machine learning in nine, you have to build the, 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 the layering system first. So that's what we're going to do. Um, let's, let's connect these. It doesn't matter. We haven't configured anything. And let's configure. Ah, uh, what's the shape? How many how many values are we starting off with? How many features? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. That's going to be tricky because we don't know. We don't know. Uh, if we look at if we look at this, remember we we XORed this and we XORed it against our feature, right? So we we chose large family, and then we looked at some logic bitwise relationship between the large family yeses and nos and all the asteroid in assigned yeses and nos. So we're actually not gonna know how many how many uh, rows we're looking at. So if you look if you if you observe this one, transpose, we have 115 columns, 114 features because this one is the label. So this one doesn't count. So we actually have 114 that need to be the shape of this layer because that's who's coming. That's how many of the columns are going to come into our model. It's tempting to want to hard code 114, but if you run this on anything other than large family in, in our example here, it, it, it's, it's just not going to be right. So we really need to get the dimensions of this guy. See this 115? And we have to pass it as a variable here. So what I'll do is I'll use something called extract table dimension. Extract table dimension. Extract table dimension. I like this node. This is one of those nodes that is very considerate. Not only does it, you just hook it up and run. How many features? columns do we have, right? Oh, look, there. But not only does it spit it out on the table, but it spits it out in a variable, which is totally what we want because we don't, we don't want to do operations on this guy with his actual data. We want to pass this attic value. It sits up in the attic of the node, right? It's a flow variable, and do math on it. Namely, we want to subtract one because that's the label. So, but it's a variable, so we're not using a math formula. We're using a math formula variable because we're operating on the variable. Number of columns, minus one. And that's gonna be the num features. And we'll convert it to an integer. Get number of features. I'm I, I totally messed that up. Features. Okay. Boom. And we're gonna feed it into here. We want it to inform our shape. So let's have oh mm -hmm. okay. Anyway. Shape, look, M shape, Keras tuple, whatever. Let's put it in there, num features. All right, it ran. 
cool because that's all we care about just getting the right shape in the beginning uh, input layer yeah, that's that's I mean it's pretty pretty obvious what that is uh, no has a starting shape of the number of columns that survived survived our XOR minus label. Okay. So we have 114 guys on this round in here, and they're going to be fed into a dense layer, which does some math. This could be an arbitrary number, um, but because, again, we, we don't know what the starting shape is, if it starts off with 60, and, and we've said that now there's they're 84, like the nature of the model changes. So I kind of want this number of units to, um, I, I kind of want this number of units to be related to the number of features I started with. Let's do another one. Let's, let's make another math formula variable. And we're going to, we're going to say this is the number of features divided by two. And we'll convert that to an integer. Num hidden one. There. And that's going to go in here, or better yet, it's going to go in here because number of hidden units there. And that's because all of the variables are piling up, right? So we have 57 here. Cool. And we're going to have this dense layer. Let's, let's call this hidden one. Hidden one. We give it a name. We're going to have this <clears throat> units equal that. I, I would love to have actually the number of features and then uh, well anyway let's, let's just start with this. It will just have a single dense layer because we don't care. Uh, well this is kind of a it's kind of a sloppy model. Let's, let's, let's have some output here. Ah, Keras set output layers. Is that is that what we want? Ah, I don't know. I don't know if this is what we want to use. Oh, this is interesting. I haven't used this one before. Uh, hmm. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to do that. This is like a way of breaking it up. I get it. Um, we're going to set the output layer this way. I'm just going to add another dense layer. And we want a yes or a no for do they have a large family or not. So actually, there's only one unit. And we're going to call this one output output okay nice so this is the output layer hidden hidden layer okay there cool we got a model now uh, let's once you've built your model, so this is the layering system that that your answers here, I say answers, but your your data here is going to pass through. So let me let me put that away. Get get these guys to go away. Because really, it's this that we we wanted. This is the this is the data. Our data. Let's make that blue. There, it's fancy. Okay, so this data needs to be fed into this model. The, the model, it, so this is a layering system, but it doesn't have any brains. Like it doesn't, it doesn't know what to multiply by. It has no, it has no knowledge of what anything looks like. All it knows is that there are 114, and then there are 57, and then there's one of some series of matrices, matrices. Matrices on what, who came from where, trained on what, we don't know. And we won't know until we apply a Keras network learner. So you've got your network learner. We're going to feed in our data. We're going to say, 
take these specific numbers from this table, booyah, right? And put them through this system that we've set up here, okay? Here's your network learner. Why can't we run it, you say? <laughs> we have to set some things up first. So we, first of all, our input data is everybody except for the label. So we want to enforce the exclusion of the label. This is why we needed it to be called label, because if it were called large family still, and we switched our topic like alcohol abuser or extraordinary or something, we'd have to redo this. We'd have to redo this selection, or we'd have to do some kind of wild card typing in to make sure we, you know, it, nobody wants to mess with that. So it's called label generically. And if we want to put the title back on, that's the reason we captured it farther up in our workflow earlier in the last recording. I think this is very cute. I, I, I love this. I love the fact that this came from only columns we care about. It's like beautiful. So we're, we're excluding these from the input data. And the target data, we're excluding everybody except for the label. This is the target. This is who we, this is what we, we want to kind of match up the yeses or nos to. It's from, uh, it's like it's from an integer, I guess. They're, they're all, they're all integers. That's what that I is, right? Or maybe they're longs. I, I don't know, whatever, but we're going to do it like that. Cool. Cool. Because we're doing yeses or nos, um, we need to set our loss function to something called binary cross entropy. What is that? Okay. You're feeding your numbers through your layers and the matrix says, I got them. I got weights. I got biases. I got, I got what values to multiply everything by. I did it one time. I need to see how those weights compare against another random shuffling, another pass through. And so when I do it again, how close is my new set of set of uh, numbers in my layers to my previous set of numbers? Am I am I getting anywhere? Am I you know what's happening as as the the machine learning model progresses? What we look at to see whether or not our machine learning um, model is more wrong uh, than it was or something like that is a loss function. So you've got your loss function and there are different, there are different ways of looking at it, but because we're doing yes or no, um, we're using binary cross entropy. If we were doing like, is this person in Taurus or are we predicting Scorpio or are we predicting Leo or something like that? And we had multiple, multiple categories. Um, then we would use categorical cross entropy. Um, and, and there are a couple of kinds of categorical cross entropy. We're not going to talk about that in here, but but you see categorical and you see sparse categorical. If you try to set something up like this and you you had, let's hit OK. Whoops, we can't. It's not going to let us. Um, well, I, I was trying to show you something, but, but we won't for now. It, yeah, that's, that's a bummer that it won't let me get out just to show you something, but... Okay, well, anyway, we're going to use binary cross entropy for the yes or no's. Let's adjust some options. This is a random seed. I want to control it. Let's put one. Let's put zero. Now let's put one. I like one. One's good. Um, cool. Advanced options. Mm -hmm. Okay, input data. Label. Why did it not like my selected target columns don't provide enough? One, to populate neurons, 57 of the output target. Hmm. Output, why does output want, why is this, why is this like this? Oh, the shape is 57. Who said the shape was 57? That's crazy. Let me get out of here. What's going on here? Input tensor is this guy. What? Okay, so so I have a problem here. Remember how I was just trying to tell you that we use binary cross entropy because it gives you a it gives you a uh, a yes or a no. Well, it, I I really need to make sure that my network layers. Uh, see, look at this guy. He's called output. Ugh. 
I'm I'm so I'm so sloppy with this. Anyway, I really need to make sure that my my network um actually obeys the right kind of math. So we can't use linear for a yes or no. We need to use sigmo sigmoid. So I've got sigmoid right there. And the other thing that I didn't do, which is the main problem, it had nothing to do with sigmoid, was that I still had num hidden as 57. Let's turn that off, right? Okay. While we're here, I can explain activation function. And activation, okay, so, so you've got your matrices, right? And they're, they're multiplying in their numbers. And basically, if they get a number, let's say it's 0.2. They want to multiply it and they want to add to it and they're going to combine it with other, other nodes, other neurons, and other layers. If you leave it the way it starts, by default, linear, then it's going to get that point 0.2 and it's going to operate on it. It's going to pass it on. It's just going to, and if it's point 0.3, it's going to pass on a point 0.3. If it's point 0.4, it's going to pass on a point 0.4. It, 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 it has no gatekeeping as far as how the math works. Uh, not the math, but how the pass through works. In order to put some gatekeeping in there and to frankly help your patterns be something other than straight lines with the data you pass in on this stream of matrices, you need, you need a pass-through rule that isn't just a straight line. And these are essentially pass-through rules, all these guys. Softmax, which by the way, you use for different categories, more than two, more than yes, no, you'll use softmax. Here, we only have two categories. And so we're going to use something called sigmoid. Sigmoid is an S-curve. And the S-curve basically says, look, if you're, if you're closer to, to zero, we're going to drag you down to zero. Otherwise, we're going to drag you up to one. And so it makes it more of a yes-no type result. You need this on your output layer for, for at least the basic model that we're building to get the yes-no probabilities to, to kind of work cleanly instead of being these, these sloppy lines. While we're there, by the way, Speaking of, of, of nonlinear pass-through, we couldn't really adjust anything on this. But, and, and remember, this is not one. It's, it's, a, it's a variable. But on this one, again, we, we kind of want, want some gatekeeping in here so that it doesn't say, oh, I got a point 0.4, pass a point 0.4, right? So, so we're going to use any of these kind of nonlinear functions very standard is ReLU, a rectified linear unit. Rectified linear unit means that if it's negative, don't pass it. Um, if it's positive, we'll pass it. So it's still linear. It's actually kind of quick because it's linear. If I get a point 0.2, I'll pass the point 0.2. If I get a negative point 0.2, I pass 0. And that way I can start like chopping out neurons that aren't doing the job. Ah, this asteroid has nothing to do with anything. And it keeps having nothing to do with anything. So drop it. ReLU will, uh, you know, having a rule like ReLU will allow you to do that. You have to watch it though, because ReLU, because it drops things out, they, your, your, your model may have dropped it out permanently. And then a later, on a later version of the data set may need it back and it can't get it back. But anyways, that's, that's more advanced stuff. So we've got a ReLU here and then we've got a sigmoid here. And we turned off that crazy parameter that said it has to be 57. Okay. And let's, oh, it forgot. Okay, look, I went in, I adjusted my layers, and now it doesn't work because it forgot how I set everything up. Target data is the label. Enforce that all the time. Input data is not the label. Enforce that all the time. Options. We'll leave all this as it is for now. I want to control what kind of randomness comes out, so I'll just put a one there. Go, booyah. Oh, it's yellow. Oh, we we're so close to running a real machine learning model. So I'm running it. Mouse over. See what happens. Oh, we got stuff. It's printing out. Things are printing. All right. We ran our model. Uh, what is this? <laughs> right. What happened? Okay. I can't read this, and I know you can't read this. So here's what happened. We took our data from in here, and we basically let this guy learn. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to air quote that because 
it actually only ran once, <laughs> one epoch. Didn't learn anything really. Uh, it may have tried uh, because it had different batch sizes, right? It, it said, oh, let me take a hundred of these 1100 records and, um, oh, no, you know what? Well, anyways, whatever. Let me, let me take a hundred of these 1100 records and try to learn some stuff. But, um, you know, really who knows, who knows what it did? Um, it, it only got one pass through. It didn't even get to improve. So how do we read this result? We have a learner. We follow it up with a Keras network executor. This thing teaches these layers how to understand the relationship in this data. Once these guys have been learned, they're going to use whatever weights and numbers they came up with to try to serve as a rule for predicting on new data. We don't have any new data. <laughs> we have old data. We have the original data. So we're going to feed the original data in there. Um, and this is basically saying, hey, here's my table. Learn the patterns from my table. Can you use the patterns you learned to predict what my original table stuff was? This is not, this is not proper machine learning, but, but we're setting it up here. So anyways, we're going to execute and let's see, the input columns will be everybody except label. We don't want label. Force the exclusion. And it has, uh, we don't need any of this. Output. We do want an output. What kind of output? From the output layer. Oh, look, our layers. Cool. All right. Hey, we win. What are we going to call this? Uh, we're going to call it prediction. run it it's so fast that's because we already taught the patterns here we're just saying okay take those patterns and multiply it all on this stuff here what do we get hmm okay i can't read this what is this so these are basically probabilities the, the, the s curve the sigmoid that we chose is dragging some guys up dragging some folks down and it's Looks like it's dragging a lot of them down. See that? Not not very many here that have 0.5. Oh, there's one. He might round up. Okay. Okay. Nice. <laughs> well, what we want to do is compare this against the true labels that we started with. So, first of all, we'll say train our model. Train model. Make predictions with our trained model. Oh yeah. Okay. So let's take this and we want the answers. We want the label column to be compared. So I'm going to, uh, hmm, let's just do a column append. This is real basic. Column append. Now, this is sloppy. I don't want to do sloppiness. Let's join. Let's use a joiner. Transpose. Him. Him. We're going to do an inner join on the row IDs. That's all. But in column selection, we only want the label. I love that Nime finally cleaned this up, this joiner. It used to be pretty rough. Okay, we only want to join the labels and we only want to join the, the predictions. We join. All the row IDs are still in there, right? Yeah, 1129. Look, okay, here's what the actual label was. Here's what the prediction was. Oh, this isn't looking very good. Hmm. Oh yeah, this is looking kind of bogus, man. Yeah, this model's bad. <laughs> All right. But and I, I warned you at the beginning of this, what was I looking at? When we round these, which we're about to do, okay, these are going down to zero. This one's also going down to zero. So this one's going to be wrong. This one's going to be wrong. This one's going to be wrong, but this one's going to say one. Oh, oh, no. These are both going to be one. Oh, this is awful. <laughs> wow. Okay. 
how do how do we okay first of all let's let's put our math formula in here uh, attach true labels to predictions okay here we're just going to round this guy round him and we don't we really didn't even need to do that we could just say convert to int and uh, replace the column prediction zero round predictions all right yep quite wrong look at that wrong got a couple of wrong ones here I got a couple of wrong ones there Pretty wrong. Very wrong. You know what? Look, I, I, I myself have not learned enough about all this to even trust Eta Delta. I don't get it. So I'm going to use Adam. Um, Adam is was kind of an earlier version of uh, these optimizer settings. Not not going to matter very much though, because we're only running for one epoch. I, I, we need to train for more than this. The cool thing about it having ones, as you'll find out, is that ones are actually in there. Uh, I've, I've found that as this thing learns, it wants to have everything be zero because most of these guys aren't, not, most of these samples aren't marked as having a large family, which was the topic that we chose, the label, right? Um, so we, we, we need to have this thing run several times. I'm going to have it run 10 times. And we're going to use one of the earlier versions of, of Adam, not, not these newer versions. You could also use, I don't know, maybe stochastic gradient descent. Basically, what, what is this? You go through one round of your machine learning training, and then you can go through a second round. And the second round can have newer results that build on what happened in the first round. How that happens is basically your optimizer. Um, one of the original kind of rules for this is stochastic gradient descent. So if you're if you're looking at this amount of deviation when you're too far back and this amount of deviation when you're too far forward, but then it reaches kind of a minimum amount of deviation, you can think of it as like a bowl, like a parabola. And what we're doing is we're taking this line and we're trying to shrink this line down to the minimum, basically. Um, that's stochastic gradient descent. And Adam is, is like an update of that. And then there's there's other versions of it. Uh, but I don't I'm, I, I don't work with this very much, so we're going to use Adam in here, and okay, training batch size, epochs, okay, cool, this will this will work, and it, here it goes. It's running, should be kind of fast, and if it's not fast, that's actually kind of good for us because I'm going to show you something else that's really neat in nine machine learning. How'd we do? Oh, zeros. Oh, no. Let's look at our specs. Oh, bad. The lower and upper bound are zeros. That's, that's not good. It, got, it, it told you that everything is zero. But we can prove this to ourselves by introducing a scorer. And the scorer is going to tell you you're given your labels and your predictions. How accurate were you? Open views. There you go. So it said that the 1,080 people who did not have a large family did not have a large family. And the 49 people who did had large families. <laughs> That's what it said. Um, it's, it's, all, it's all just kind of, yeah, I don't know. It, it, this didn't it didn't find the patterns. It didn't find what makes a uh, makes for a large family. Now there there are a couple of points about this. First of all, we have set up a machine learning model. That's that's cool. It's really because the data is so sparse. It's not. We said it's yes or no, but it's really mostly no. And because it's mostly no, I, I don't I don't personally I don't think the machine learning on this kind of data that looks like this 
this stuff over here with all these blank spaces and, and you don't even know about these guys? I mean, even if you successfully trained a machine learning model, um, basically it, it's, it's training you what is both having the trait and being known to have the trait. And so there are hidden assumptions behind such sparse data. So for example, alcohol, okay? First of all, is alcohol the same as abuses alcohol? I don't know. Why are there two columns? Just looks, I, I guess. I don't know, maybe. But, but somehow, what, is, is, is that to lead us to believe that these people didn't use alcohol? I don't know, man. Alcohol is kind of, who, who knows that? Who documents that? And so even if we successfully trained our machine learning model on data like this, which is the kind of data we have for astrology, right? We don't, we don't send out surveys to all people across history to say, no, you must check this box, yes or no, right? So this is kind of difficult. You can, you can do it, and, and I would do it more on text data from wikis, which is what I normally work with. But, but because at least there you, can, you have a richer set of variables or something like that. This sparse data here, it's like, it's thankless. We, we went through all the trouble to set up a machine learning model, and it, it, it's not even, even if we found the patterns, somebody in here uses alcohol, right? Somebody in these, these missings. And so it's not like the missings are definitely zero. We force them to be. But we'd be finding a pattern which is just based on something that is not even public enough to find a pattern on. Um, so congratulations, if, even if you succeed in what we just tried, you, you would have succeeded in a, like a half, like a public version of the trade. So anyways, that's just something to note because these, these, these guys here aren't really gonna, they're not really gonna succeed. Um, but, but let me tell you how to do some fancy stuff. Cause it's actually, it's actually kind of cool how this works. Let me, uh, adjust some, something here. Man, I sat on this computer too long and I needed to get up and get some more coffee. So I just had a jump cut <laughs> because I don't, I don't edit these. Uh, I'm just, I'm just doing this stuff for funsies. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to hang out on the internet. So uh, now we, we produced a model and it, this is our confusion matrix. And indeed our model is confused. There's not enough, there's, I, you know, so machine learning is probably not the proper thing to, to do this analysis on. Here's what you should do. Um, we'll get back to machine learning in a second, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a side road. The data that came in, was already nicely, neatly filtered. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, it was, it was kind of ready to go. You know what I'm saying? It, it just, if you could just see if there are differences between the groups. Are there differences between these groups on uh, it, between the one group and the zero group on these features? 115. Then, uh, I mean, you can you can at least verify that. Uh, now, we what's going to happen is that we won't know how they interact with each other, and we won't even know if this was the right group. But but there's just a different kind of analysis. There's several different kinds of analysis that you should run on this kind of data. I mean, I would run maybe something like a a what a logistic regression because that's another version of yes, no. And I wonder if the logistic regression is not, nah, it's looking for strings. Okay. It needs nominal values. So let's do a number two string right here. Actually, I don't, I don't even want to do a number to string because it's not specific enough. Let's, let's get something that's nice and specific. We'll put in a rule engine here. This is, this is a side road that we're taking, but it's a, it's a better road. The label, if the label is one, then turn it into, uh, man, I'd love to turn it into large family. And we don't have that information. Let's go back and get, remember up here, peel the topic from the first line. We did that. Let's put it in now, right there. Actually, we could put it 
right here before we even train on machine learning, which means every node downstream from it is going to get that variable. So see now in flow variables, look, family large, it's deposited as in, in the attic of all these guys' nodes, including this rule engine. There it is, family large. Um, it's, I, hmm. No, I, it's, it's kind of weird that th the name of the variable is family large. Uh, doggone it, man. Row filter. Uh, what a bummer. Okay. It, let, let's, let's rename that. Let's rename that column. That's, that's not legit. So variable expressions. Variable expressions right here. From here, there, our function will be called um, uh, is it should I should I call it column zero? Hmm. I'm trying to use what do I have here? Huh, I need to think about this because I want this to be a such a bummer. Let's just do a basic column rename. Let's do column expressions, column expressions in there. And we're going to take column zero, zero and Evaluate it, family large. Okay. We're going to call this one um, label topic just so we can distinguish it from these other guys. It's a string. Yeah, column zero. It, it's kind of dumb that I did, had to do it this way, but, but <laughs> put topic in a column not its own name. We may have done that before down here. Did we already do that? No, we didn't because we, we had missings in here and we really needed the name. So this was, this was useful. Okay. This guy gets passed into the table row to variable and this variable, let's run it. See the variables? This variable is one we can generically use, right? Because it won't always be named this. That was my problem. Okay. So if the label topic equals zero, then we'll call it normal. Normal. Otherwise, we'll call it what it is. But we're going to replace our label. Aha! Wait a minute. It's backwards. It's totally backwards. Wait a minute. What is that? Oh, what happened here? Lower bound, family law. What is this? I need to look at my values here. Uh, let's look at our data table. Zero and one. Are these longs or are these integers? I think they're longs. Hmm. Okay. In order to convert a long value to an integer, you need to have double to int. This is, I know, it's all strange, but, um, well, nothing, no, I guess they are integers. Huh. Okay, well, that's odd. If the label topic equals 
No. Oh, you know what? Okay, if the label equals zero, psh, the label is the column we're looking at. Then make it normal. Otherwise, it becomes the label topic. Got it. All right. That's it. That's 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 what I did wrong. Okay, good. This is better. See that? Nice. And because this is a string, it lends itself to a logistic regression learner. And the target column is label, and the default is going to be normal. And let's see if any of these guys. Oh, look at that. Stochastic average gradient. There it goes again. Let's see if any of these affect this. I'm just I'm just kind of curious, right? It didn't converge, right? Yes, it did. Of course not. Um, but let's look at the coefficients and p-values as well. Sort descending, sort ascending. Okay, we got a little bit of a statistical significance here with these little guys. These these here. Look at that. Chaldea in. <laughs> is that so funny? This is funny because. I know a little bit about Valborg. Valborg is the uh, the soap opera asteroid where you're surrounded by drama, and uh, Valborg and Leo is like I guess like public drama. So that's kind of legit in terms of uh, being associated with uh, family large. Now the coefficient is negative, so that's that's curious, right? But Chaldea in Cancer, you know. Cancer for family. Okay, not bad, not bad. Look, the point is we have statistical significance on something. Um, and it was just an ANOVA. It was just trying to see if there were differences. But, uh, yeah, kind of cool. We ran the ANOVA. The rest of these guys didn't really, didn't really make the ANOVA. But, yeah. So this is the... Oh, I said ANOVA. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm talking logistic regression. Um... Yeah, but still, still, still kind of cool, kind of cool. We could use a row filter on this and then chop out these guys that are, that are uh, above 0.05. And you might say that these are the four asteroids that make sense as being associated with large family and call it a day. In terms of machine learning, I mean, did we, did, you know, the machine learning wasn't able to find stuff like this. Um, not with the model that we set up. But Anyways, uh, still we have we have the machine learning setup, which is kind of fun, kind of fun to know how to do. But at the end of the day, our data doesn't really it's not really it's not it's not really prepped for this kind of analysis. You might get away with this kind of analysis. Um, the logistic regression learner, by the way, learns coefficients just like these other guys do. And if you wanted to apply those coefficients, you'd use the logistic regression predictor. Um, it'd be the same kind of thing. But it thinks, based on its training, that, that these guys were significant. And you can, you can take that analysis to town and do a lot more with it. What I want to kind of finish with, so, so this, is the, this is, let me, let me label this. Make label a string again. What um, independent variables, this is logistic regression, independent variables are significant in our topic. Okay, that's it for that. I think I'm going to put an annotation on here, workflow annotation. There. And say, I don't like the yellow. I, don't, I think it's no good. LR is more suited to this kind of data, to our kind of data here. Okay. That's enough of that. Now, back to this guy. I don't I don't I don't even know if 
the I don't I don't know if this setup is legit with the Relu or if okay this has to be sigmoid for for what we're trying to do um maybe we need to change the number of hidden layers maybe we need to change parameters in here i mean train for more epochs change the learning rate i mean how do we how do you figure out like how to even build this model we don't we don't even know if if we've done the right thing okay we're going to get fancy and do some some uh, interesting stuff with nine. First of all, I want to be able to run multiple models, and and I don't know which models, if any, make sense. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to use flow variables. Yeah, we have some time. We're going to use flow variables to change these guys, and uh, just you know give them give them. Uh, different parameters. You have a confusion matrix, but you also have accuracy statistics that come out of the confusion matrix. And you can see that, oh, well, it's like, oh, your F measure is very good. Well, I mean, you give everybody zero and you're mostly right. But, you know, well, what we really want is specificity, right? See, the specificity is zero. And we, we need for our... Uh, we need for our, uh, I guess our, uh, I said we had true positives and then we had false negatives. We really need for our true negatives, I guess, to be correct. So we've, we've, we've messed this up. Uh, I, I, let's, let's see what we got here. We're gonna collect these accuracy statistics based on some parameters that we're feeding into our model and we're going to we're going to move this guy over and set up a loop a series of loops uh look, first let's look at what kinds of parameters we want to vary uh hmm i'm I, i'm going to only stick with one unit but it's not one unit i'm one hidden layer for this but i'm going to change the number of units first of all and I want to change the activation function, maybe. And I want to... Okay, so there's that. I want to change the learning rate, maybe. And I want to change the number of epochs. We might change the batch size, but let's, let's just not change the batch size. Let's just start with epochs and learning rate and activation function and units. We're going to change those. And we're just going to run different models differently um, with, with, with separate kinds of parameters. So I'm going to make four tables. And this is going to be our number of hidden units. And this one is going to be our activation. This is going to be our hidden activations. This one is going to be our learning rate. And one more. This one is going to be our number of epochs. Alrighty. Let's build some tables. Now, let's start with something simple. You saw the learning rate in here was 0 0.001. That's actually kind of good. Let's, let's uh, set our learning rates to 0 0.001. 0, 0, 0.005 and 0, 0.001. Double click and we're going to call this LR. It's a double. 
It's a decimal. Okay, that's it for that. You can run it. Ready. The number of hidden units. Uh, let's let's go with. I don't know. Hard coded. Twenty and forty and sixty. Mm, no, let's just do it with twenty and fifty. Because I, I don't want too many permutations of this thing. So this one's called HU. No. Hidden units param. How about that? This is also a no, this is an integer. Okay. That's a whole number. Run that. The number of epochs. We're going to say for 10 or for 50. Come over here. Epochs. And this is an integer. Okay. And lastly, hidden activations. Sigmoid. No, not sigmoid. Tan H, Relu, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be sigmoid. It could be sigmoid. Now, this particular one gets tricky, and I'm going to show you something um, when we run into the issue. But this will be called active. Activation. Okay. Let's run that. These are the different kind of options that I want to run these models on. All right? And now, here's our friend, the cross joiner. There he is. He's back. You know what's going to happen here. You know what's happening. We have our cross joiner, and we're going to cross join our cross joiners. And what do we get? Whoa, 36 combinations of things. Yes. And then what? Well, of course, you've seen this before. Table row to variable. All right. Boom. And we're going to run it. It picks up only the first one, right? We're going to put it in. Oh, wait a minute. It, it, how? What? Okay. So we need to either feed this guy into one of these, or let's just use another kind of funny one. Merge variables. Let's merge these variables here. You go in there. You go in there. And you both go in here. Okay, there we go. Alrighty. We've merged the variables. Now let's do some selection. That runs. And this one, we're going to have it use hidden units as a flow variable. It's not going to be num hidden. It's going to be hidden units per ram. And then we're also going to have the activation function be activation. All right. What? What? Illegal exception. No enum. What happened here? No enum. No tan h. Man. But it says. It says tan H right there. I spelled it right. Here's what you do. Select tan H and go to flow variables. Take this off. Don't, don't, don't tell it something it didn't like. Instead, ask it what it likes. Act. I'll just call it act. Run it. Look at the flow variables. Look at this. Act was written as capital 10H. This is how we figure out what is in a variable. You, you go into your flow variables 
and you have it write it out in here. And it'll just tell you what all these parameters are, all these guys. You can actually ask what they wrote. It's really cool. So now that we know that, we don't, we don't actually need this. I don't need this. What I'm going to go back and do, because I, I knew we were going to run into that problem. So what I'm going to go back and do is go to my hidden activations and turn it into the versions I know Nime likes. The capped version. It likes those. Cross join it. And now go back, flow variables, and try activation again. Ah, legit. Okay. So we changed both activation and hidden units parameter to obey our variables. Now let's come over here. Epochs and learning rate need to obey our parameters as well. So let's go into our flow variables. You got to dig for this one. General settings, optimizer, 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 Adam LR, <laughs> right? That's the learning rate. And let's see if we can find epochs. There's epochs, epochs, epochs. Boom. Does it run? Apparently it does run. It's doing some stuff. What is it doing? Well, anyway, we don't know yet, but it's doing some stuff. It's executing. All right. Did it work? No, <laughs> it still sucks as a model, but we parameterized, which means that we can, we can uh, keep this thing going. Now, this was our result. And if we're going to be collecting accuracy statistics, I would love to turn our variables into columns, frankly. Like, that would be neat. Let's see if we can do it. Is there a node? I've never used such a node, so I don't know. We'll find out. Variable to table column? I, does this work? I, I, wow. Uh, that'd be neat. OK, take your variables. Take your accuracy statistics and put them on there. Does this work? I, it, it doesn't look like it, really. Variable to table column. It includes, contains all the variables converted into new columns in the resulting table. Maybe I have to configure this. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is awesome. I've never used this node. So, Yo, this is everything. Look, oh, we're just gonna go shopping then. We want, we want the label topic, which is family large. We want the mm, hidden units activation LR epochs. Um, it'd be cool to have the number of features and. Dude, we could just we could just put the whole thing in there, really. Um, and then these are already supported. We got the labels, the accuracy. Wow. Okay, that's nice. Oh, well, this accuracy is from the machine learning model itself. Error. Okay. Uh, I, I we could put the error in there. Cohen's kappa. Nice. Okay, cool. We just, we just filled up our shopping cart. Whoa, look at this. Yeah. We got data. Okay. So these are the specs of our model. Is get accuracy stats. And then this one is attach various params. This table... Here, we're just going to collect them. How are we going to collect them? One more thing. We're almost there. This is a table row to variable loop. I need to save this. I haven't saved it at all. I'm, I'm flirting with disaster. OK, there we go. Boom. Table row to variable loop. 
and variable, variable, <laughs> variable. <laughs> Table wrote a variable, <laughs> a variable loop. I'm sorry. I was, it's 1:53 a.m. in the morning. I'm, I'm, you know, a little bit excited. Loop end. Let's add an iteration column, generate brand new IDs, and ignore empty tables. Don't change these specs. And for every combination of params, see how our model did. Let's run it. I'm going to run it, but, but then really quickly, I'm going to dash over to, oh, it's doing it. It's doing it. Okay. Right click on this. Go to view learning monitor. I don't know if I've shown you this. Look at this. As, as the Keras network learner is running, you can actually watch the monitor go. And it's, it's showing you all the, like the loss functions and the, the, look, it's trying to do it again. Oh, it's doing it again on a new set of parameters, this time with 50 epochs. See, you can look at the training data, you can look at the loss, and if you want a smoother line, you click that. And, uh, okay, I like this. I like this. But, but, but I don't like it. And let me tell you why. I'm going to cancel this because like, I'm, I'm going to stop it now. It's just going to, it's going to cut it out. Stop it. Stop it from going. We're so close to having some legit machine learning going on here. The problem is that we started off with this data and we're training it on data and then we're testing on the data that we're training it on. And we have no way of checking either whether or not we're even doing a good thing. We need to split our data into a group that trains the model, a group that checks to see if the model weights as applied are making sense. It's called a validation set and a group that it's supposed to legitimately predict on, which is the testing set. Okay, so we need a training set in here, a validation set in there, and a testing set in there. And here's how we will produce that. We're going to use a partition node. And we're just going to, we're just going to put it in there. See, we have this, this model going into like three different places. But yeah, that's not, that's not right. Partitioning allows us to take the top 70% randomly. And uh, let's use a random seed. Oh, no, no, no. We're going to, we're going to take it. We're going to, yeah, yeah, we, we, we use a random seed, but the random seed will be one. And it'll shuffle our stuff. Okay. Top is going to be training. And the bottom is going to be other. That's another data set. Run it. And it, it, it took our 1,100 rows and said, I'm going to train on 790 of them. And then the rest of them, these 339 are going to be split again. And of this, I want a kind of a two thirds ratio because it's like 10%, right? Um, validation and 20% from the whole group uh, testing set. So let's take 33% from the top here and the top will be validation. So the model as it's training can check to see if it's on the right track. And the bottom will be testing, testing set. I mean, as long as we're in the machine learning mode and we're trying to predict, let's see if we can get some real prediction going. Okay, we're going to train on this and we're not going to see that training data again. It's going to teach the brown nodes and that's all it's going to do. We're going to validate on this. We're going to test on this and the testing is the truth so we're going to join the testing to these guys results 
Okay. I'm not sure why that... Oh, good. That was scaring me with the red light. It was scaring me. <laughs> but it worked. Okay. This is legitimate machine learning. It's going to not work <laughs> because of the many times I've already told you that our data is really no good for this kind of problem. But we are like set up. This workflow the way it is, it's doing some machine learning. Well, it's doing some matrix cramming. <laughs> it's not going to learn. I, I don't expect it to learn much, um, but it's it's making an attempt at least. And we can, we can watch the learning monitor and just, yeah. But see, now that we have validation data, we can look in here and watch the validation data go. All right. And really the, what, really the validation loss is what I'm concerned with. Okay, they had a loss, but I mean, you know, oh, that that's not bad. It it didn't it didn't like plateau. I'm gonna pause this so you can kind of see what's happening. We're gonna pause the execution, let it run through this round. And uh okay, let's see what happened. Oh look. True positives, false positives, recall, specificity. Model still sucks, <laughs> but we're collecting data on these. I mean, part of machine learning is just going through a bunch of bad models until you've uh, got something sharp. So they don't they don't just come out with these 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 speech bots and all this other stuff just like oh I got it and they, you know they don't. It's a bunch of experimentation. So these rows are going to keep being stacked. Now I'm just going to let it resume. I'll pause the recording while it goes through all 36 of these models. And you can see that right now it's on iteration four out of 30. It's going to go up to 35. But yeah, look, it's on five now. It's just running different models with different, different combinations of things. And it's, it's trying out different little little sad variable, you know, I, I don't know if 10 or 50 is right. And certainly we could have done math formulas on these things and we could have done more models and everything, but I'm liking this. When I first started working with machine learning, I worked in Jupyter Notebooks and um, then moved over to Google Colab. And I was like, oh my God, Nime and that, that Keras set up at the back end and the nodes and had a Conda install. Um, it, there's a, there's a, there's a, you have to you have to like get so far in the merging how nime works with all of this before you can appreciate why you would want to use nime to do this um but i mean it, you know it's visual programming we didn't do any code like we didn't if you you if you want to get your Keras dense layer out of here you're like, well, is this really a Keras layer? Where's the code? Can I, can I uh, get it into Python? Or like, if I didn't want to work with it in Nine, could I? Yes. Click here, and you can see that there is a Keras, ah, Keras network writer. It writes H5. It's got it writes model formats. It spits them out just like any other save format, and you can load them. Elsewhere. So we train this model on this data here and then we, we leave. We go to another computer, we go online or what whatever. Um so yeah. All right, let's it's kind of cool. It's on on model number eleven. Let me pause this recording and uh we'll see what the results are in a few minutes. Well, for you it'll be a few seconds. The run is done and we're gonna see it together for the first time. Let's see what happened. Okay, so looks like most of these models are are going to be failures for the most part, right? Uh, I'm I'm oh, what is this? What is this one? This is weird. Specificity of huh? What what is this one? What? 
Oh man, some of these are kind of odd. Kind of odd. Um, hmm. Wow. I don't know what's going on with these. Curious. Ridiculous error. This error is real bad. <laughs> uh, wow. Okay, well, anyways, <laughs> we, we, it appears that we've built 36 terrible models, but, but you have parameters here. Uh, I'm not, I'm not even like trying to go through these, but what is this? Cohen's Kappa, this one here, error is 0.035. Ah, what is this one? Because if you, if you look at the kinds of problems we've been having, like 224400, and it wasn't like, you know, true negatives, uh, true positives, true negatives. If you go through here, okay, this one was... It, it tried, <laughs> but, uh, but, okay, yeah, okay, you know, maximum, maximum performance on true negatives is one, but, uh, yeah, we've collected our, our stats, and, I mean, not a lot of predictive power in here, not a lot at all, but, I mean, all things considered, we look at our scorer in our confusion matrix without all the without all the uh, the extra information here. You can see that apparently in our testing set there were a mere four four people marked as large family. And we could just look at this last uh, kind of piece of data here, and you know, there's one out of these two twenty eight. There's two, there's three, there's four, four, it's just four. What a dang shame. So it turns out that, that when we collect our results here and we get even one true negative, even one, I hear, I don't know if that was luck or what, but it had one true negative, um, three false positives, five false negatives but but if we were like if we had bigger sets or better data i mean this one had, this one hey it got it got three true negatives <laughs> but this is worth investigating this maybe we needed to run this particular model for longer like more epochs or something um and we probably did because it was a relu and um it, it was only 10. We ran it on 50, and then it's like, oh, no, I know better. And nobody had a large family. Okay, so it just, I don't know. We, we could have overfit some stuff in here. But, yeah, man, if you had to find a, quote, best model, it's this one. Um, but, man, neat, right? We were able to do all that, all that machine learning. And, furthermore, first of all, I need to say this. Furthermore, hopefully the way we designed it, we could come into this, change large family, and go to memory's bad. Uh, this is completely random. Memory's bad. And I don't think it's going to make it all the way through. There's surely a parameter that we didn't. Yeah, okay. So there's something we didn't do in here. Remove missings. Get the row with the topic name column to test memory is bad yeah the my row filter was not generic enough on this one so i'd have to go in there and parameterize it um actually you know column to test low variables let's see column name oh i didn't save the column name dang it well whatever doesn't matter um the point is let's see if we can run it through here it's trying See if we can run this one as well. Oh, it, it wasn't finished. It's not even finished yet. I'm going to pause this. Okay, so now I've unpaused it, and it went right through. It's doing it again. 
all our hard work paid off. You're like, how did it pay off? Well, I just changed the topic. It's not family large anymore. It's memories bad. And okay, we'll run the logistic regression and sort by p-value. These were found significant in the ANOVA. Oh, sorry, the uh, logistic regression on memories bad. <laughs> Atalante. That's where you sell yourself out, basically. Um, no, the constant, we need to drop that. Nausicaa, where you're at home in your own skin. Um, interesting. Uh, uh huh. But, and, and how many columns are we working with? Is it 114 now? No, it's 116. And because we did so much in the way of parameterization, we actually don't have to change anything. Um, so this is like a super kind of machine learning thing. I'm, I'm very happy with it. Um, the only thing I need to do is parameterize, parameterize this. I think this is wrong for right now. I'm going to mark it in red because I need to come back and it's, it's, it's an erroneous setup. I need to go change that. But this is it. Um, surely you won't be working with the same data set. But the kind of tricks that we've done between this video for the machine learning half and really the XOR strategy in the previous video for just distilling your options. I mean, if, if even if these guys aren't really built for the kind of sparse data and small data sets and non-granular sign stuff, you can imagine swapping out signs with, uh, I don't know, aspects. Has a conjunct, has a trine, yes or no. Um, or something even more categorical and running the same kind of thing. But even if the ML is not what you use, you could still get away with using a logistic regression and saying, yeah, apparently these, these placements were consistently, I mean, they were, they're actually statistically significant. Um, the ML is there to tell you that, that when I combine those placements in a certain way, I can kind of predict what the topic was, but I mean, the cosmos is huge. Who knows if you could just pick out five random asteroids from the first thousand and, and come up with a reasonable probability prediction of whatever topic we chose. I don't know. I don't know about all that. But certainly for funsies, we have the basic setup here. I turned off the recording uh, and paused it temporarily because I wanted to see the results of Memories Bad before we close this. Here are the results. We ran a bunch of models, but I call your attention to this one, this model. This one found two of a possible seven memories bad, right? And that was actually a specificity, which is kind of what we want to look at, um, partly at least. It, it had a specificity of 28%. I mean, it's 28%, right, on just a couple of hundred, but... It, it, it had false positive, granted, false, false positive rate of 15. So these people, the model thinks they had bad memories. Did they? I don't know. Maybe they did. Um, they, they are labeling, right? We're not going to, we're not going to like give more credit to this whole analysis than is due. But note that there were seven who were tagged as having bad memories. And this one found two of them. Um, that's hard to do. And so 15 false positives and then, um, uh, 207, oh, by, by the way, positives and negatives are flipped in this case. Positives would mean normal. Most of the people are normal. So 206 of our uh, 221 normal people were marked as normal. But this model ran for 50 epochs. And remember, we only went up to 50. We didn't do 500 or anything like that. And it used 10H with a learning rate of... Uh, point it, it, we never went down to zero so it was a learning rate of 10 to the negative uh, four but, but but this model actually seems like it calculated something right it found some predictive something on the training set and it applied it to the testing set and was able to get two out of seven right okay um not bad considering, you know, with all the things that we talked about, and we really aren't expecting any results, um, to, to get this is, is actually kind of 
kind of okay. And I didn't even try. Like, they could have added more layers. I only had one hidden layer in this model, and I really probably needed more. Um, but, but this was just kind of a, a sample. So I wanted to call your attention to that. And although this video is not getting into the notion of machine learning interpretability, you can, by the way, in your output layers, whoops, in this, uh, in this here, actually it's not this one, it's this one. You can add other outputs, like add output, and you can spit out what the hidden layer and the input layer actually had as coefficients, as weights. Um, and if you want to do some analysis on that, have at it. Now, it's going to get a little bit tricky because they're dense layers and they're, they're taking input from all kinds of layers before them. But if you wanted to know the weights and biases and things like that, um, there are ways to, to actually get that and see in the way that Google Playground has you kind of feeding through um, watching it. You can get a piece of that, at least in Nime. And if you want to do it Pythonically, uh, oh, sorry, using Python, you don't even have to use these. You can use straight Python and get it. As far as who the culprits might be, our logistic regression showed that these guys had positive coefficients for bad memories. These had negative and positive coefficients given that the reference group was normal. So the more positive it was, the more it climbed away from normal and towards memories bad. And so these three, Adelante and uh, Scorpio, where you sell yourself out, um, under pressure, basically, or as a pressure person. Uh, and Pella, where you build a creative empire based on analysis. You can think of this as really excessive nitpicking. Um, and Lumen, I don't remember what Lumen does as an asteroid, but these might be things to look at. So I was going to go ahead and close this video by saying, you know, maybe machine learning it, it needs to be tempered with a bit of common, not common sense, but common practice on how we normally decide what an asteroid does. We're like, well, I've observed it in these people, and this is the pattern that I get. But uh, turns out that the ML actually found something, and the logistic regression found something. And they meet. I mean, when I say something, I mean P.05, right? So pretty legit. It turns out that maybe there's some hope even on uh, some, some questionable data. Not, I mean, look, the Astro Data Bank stuff is really good. But for machine learning, questionable. Um, but uh, apparently there's some hope for the use of ML even on that data after all.